Be afraid. Be very afraid. Here's Johnny. <gasps> it's alive! Do you want to play the game? I see dead people. The power of Christ compels you! Death. I hate to break it to you. You're gonna die. Nobody's ever made it out alive. A truth as cold as the Rockies. <laughs> Coming to you live from Rocky Mountain, Colorado. It is Nick's Nonfiction with your host, Nick Muniz. Thank you all for tuning back in for another episode. And this is easily our darkest hour. We are going into John Douglas's Mind Hunter. What do we do on this show? We talk about people who are the best at their craft. And John Douglas has scrounged America to find the most efficient rapist and systematic murderers in our country. It is October. We are keeping the spirit of the months alive on the show. And it is the 10th episode. Yes, that is very true. <laughs> we got a goddamn soundboard going on. Radio skills out the wazoo. It's only getting better from here on out. Are we not excited to see what 20 episodes deep looks like? I know I am. Thank you guys. I really appreciate the support. I really <laughs> I really appreciate the constructive criticism. People telling me how much they hate me and how much my equipment sucks. I'm going to start a Patreon. If you're going to insult me, you have to donate $5 so I could buy better equipment. That's the toll. I love it. Any type of interaction, if you're going to tell me you want to take a dump on my corpse, we're learning about worse things from John Douglas this month. It doesn't offend me. I like that you're getting involved in the show. You're not trolling, man. You're just feeding the fire. It's the Trump mentality. Have this guy get to be president. Any press is good press. And we're growing here on Nick's Nonfiction. So for the newbies, if you don't know what the show is about, read the title. Different nonfiction book from a comic every single month. Boom. And this month for October, you guessed it, it's getting dark. October is a drinking month though, so pour yourself a highball, sit back if you need to. It took me a while to get through this book because there's some of the darkest shit that I have ever had to... I couldn't think to do a lot of these things. John Douglas came across the skin suit that they thought of Buffalo Bill for The Silence of the Lambs was based off of. <laughs> this goes deep, man. These are the darkest thoughts people in our country have ever thought. What do we do with this show? You embrace the crazy, you embrace the dark side. And that's what John Douglas was able to do. He was a hunter. They're the killers. He's the hunter tracking these people down through society. It was a really good read. So keep drinking through October. I love the streets of Denver. The people here, <laughs> the crazy hippies, man. They think it's a cosplay convention every single day so you don't know who's in costume getting ready for halloween or who's just methed out and pissing on the 16th street mall it's a good old time literally any tuesday this month you can pull up to a bar get shrecked find a degenerate girl who fancies a tuesday night cocktail or nine and go about your night it's truly a great month to pour one up <laughs> read or watch some true crime Netflix just put out Mindhunter Season 2 who's hungry? A little cannibalism? True crime is a weird thing I never got into the CSI had tons of girlfriends that tried to make me watch it with them and that's when you're pulling moves within the first five minutes of a show trying to get you got to be stuck in so I don't care to find out who the killer is we'll act out our fantasies and then 25 minutes later when they're showing who the killer is we're cleaned up and ready to tune back in. <laughs> I never really got the true crime thing. It is totally viral on the internet. So yes, we are dipping our toe for Nick's nonfiction. And like I said, I think it really did drain my brain for a month just reading about intestines being pulled from people's stomach cavities. Not as fun as a clown pulling ribbons out of people's throats, which I would much rather, being the clown college that I am. <laughs> Keep on keeping on over at Harry Shit. Over 12,000 followers. Who would have thunk it? Let's keep doing it up. Funny memes are going. This past month, I'm just disappointed, man. The whole Epstein thing was forgotten. That was like left wing, right wing, both pushed one story. Neither side believed the official story. Oh, suicide. And everybody just went back to their sides. That was a time to unite and realize that we need to be looking for truth. So that kind of bummed me out. <laughs> 
Um, the Area 51 raid was a dud. I mean, you would have got mowed down by any friggin' uh, Air Force Predator drones. Could have blown up every Kyle in the country. It wasn't quite a fair match. <laughs> and also, the Hong Kong protest, this is like the this is the biggest civil protest in human history. There are millions of humans. It's just a size of scale. There's billions of people in China, so no one's noticing. <laughs> or maybe it's the news doesn't want you to know. Yeah, there's literally millions of humans protesting how they don't want to be part of this Chinese billion people army republic. They just want to be the city of Hong Kong, but no, all that censorship is just getting worse. It's being suppressed. Tencent bribed Reddit with over $100 million to remove a single trending post. Censorship is on the rise, people. So I'm responding to all the DMs. Hit me on any of those platforms and munez at udel.edu. I'll respond to whatever. If you, if you want to talk politics, let's do it there so we're not losing listeners and followership here. And let's learn a little bit about John Douglas before we start hunting some mines. Johnson and Johnson Douglas, his birth name. John Douglas was born in 1945 from a real Brooklyn cat drinking his water and coffee. He's now 74. And this book, Mindhunter, is a biography. What is the meaning of a biography? It means it is a book about the author. So this about the author does not need to be more than a minute or two. <laughs> Biographies are just a subset of nonfiction, but you know, Nick's autobiographies doesn't have the same ring. And this isn't actually quite an autobiography here, Mind Hunter, because John Douglas and Mark Olshaker wrote this, who is a novelist, nonfiction author, and even like director of shows. That is a hashtag ghost writer. Drake is about to clown you, Mr. Douglas. Watch your back in any rap battle. You are done, you 74-year-old old head. <laughs> John's career in the FBI, the investigative support unit, he got to rename that and then populate with all of his own people. He was only in there for 20 years, but a 20-year career of hunting hunters of people is enough to make you tap out and earn a pension because he's not making big bucks either and he's doing some of the best work for society. He was only on the force from 1979 to 1996, which was when, it talks about this all throughout the book, the ISU and the support units deep in the FBI were really getting to learn that killing is a whole new game. It's not the mafia trying to take control of a city. There are these always white dudes crazy motherfuckers that can't keep their shit together and instead of thriving at some sort of skill they like to rape and murder people and they're really good at it and so you have to have these really good detectives finding them and that weighed a lot on mr douglas it weighed a lot on me to try to just say that right now and so you could see why he would want to retire a little bit earlier he's not your local beat cop he had jurisdiction over any case in the country in the United States. And he started going overseas to Europe to help out later in his career. He could have gone to anywhere in the country, looked at a court case and been like, all right, let me take this over. I've seen this one a million times. He talks about how the social context of like, there was the Manhattan bomber, if you ever heard of, we'll get in depth later. Some guy in Finland was like, this man will be a single virgin living with his parents in upstate Connecticut. And the New York PD went up to Connecticut and was like, that's the bomber there jerking off in the back of a, <laughs> a nudie mag store or whatever those trench coat dudes did back then. It's some dude with a weird prediction in Finland found it. There's these weird stories that play themselves out. And John Douglas, with this 20-year career, was able to get on the same frequency as serial killers and you see through the show i watched like all the odd numbered episodes i couldn't lay that much time into it because it, you say once you read the book versus the movie the book has so much more info on this guy's life and they put way too much time into that fake girlfriend in the show you don't need to have a love interest this is about murder and true crime thank you very much skip scene the book is plenty Shows you how he had jurisdiction over everywhere in the country, hunting down assassins, prostitute killers, child murderers. As a detective, I see him as a predator of predators. He is the super predator. 
he's finding people that are the Michael Jacksons, the terrible Harvey Weinsteins, Jeffrey Epsteins. And so the earlier ones, he's doing some more autobiography talking about himself. But towards the later chapters in this book, it's basically John Douglas writing about like his greatest hits, all of his greatest cases, the craziest murderers that he came across and the best bread trail chase cases that these super smart killers led him on this book is an account of that whereas that tv show you might want to go tune out and go watch that right now that show is just dragging out one of these chapters for an entire season and i'm about to condense that into five minutes with some laughs for you this book's been a bestseller for 25 years john douglas is guilty of murder this dude is making a killing himself (laughs) and we'll skip over the prologue because it's an eight yeah that just hurt your brain too 18 chapter book the prologue was called i must be in hell i really can't mock this guy though (laughs) he's done the best stuff for a functioning society so we don't get picked up in rapist vans i'm a white male they don't rape other white males usually he called it i must be in hell and the basic point of the prologue was throughout his 20 year fbi investigative support unit experience he boiled down why plus how equals who did it that's his little detective equation that's all you have to learn he went back to school like 10 times and he was saying through the prologue get your experience and then you'll learn to think like them and you'll know why would someone want to do this messed up childhood how did they do this equals that's who the killer is and let's get into chapter one of mind hunter inside the mind of a killer where we are every month here on Nick's Nonfiction. John started the book very humbly comparing himself to a lion. Okay, tough guy. I think, like I said, the predator of a predator before, he's more of the tracker. Like, the lion is the one doing the hunting of the little kids on the playground. That's the predator. That's the pedophile. John Douglas is the hunter. He is tracking down the animal that is loose on the streets. But... I do not want to leave this comparison giving child predators the awesome title of lions because they do not track down their prey with speed and agility. They use lollipops and vans like little cowards. (laughs) I would even get in that van. Make it a little more challenging. If a predator can break five tackles with a five-year-old under their arm, I think that kid is theirs. There's a lot of kids out there. This is why I see him as more of a tracker. Remember Stratego, that game where there's the 10, the highest level of the game, and you could just boys around the board going and slaughtering everyone else's pieces? There's a spy on the board that literally can't do anything except for kill the 10s. And so John Douglas has the capability to be a smart enough guy to just ride around the country killing people, doing whatever the heck he wants. But he's the spy. He's putting in the work for a government salary to catch these tens these level 10 peoples that are off the charts and so john's saying you got to be a hunter you got to be ready to kill the lion or else it's going to kill you too his first major point throughout the book and how he ends it what he learned throughout his career is learning to think like the killers makes catching them a million times easier he said it takes two years of experience as a detective to learn this and that's how he did it the first two years were not pretty he was doing like sting operations watching hostage negotiations guys blowing their heads off in these negotiations You need to have that under your belt if you're going to try to learn to think like a killer who's been skinning cats in the woods in his neighborhood since he was eight. You got to see a couple people go crazy too. So John Douglas, what he's known for in the academic world and in the show, he started this program with the investigative support unit where they would go into prisons and just talk to rapists and murderers and pick their minds. And the whole friggin' drama they draw out to like 20 minutes every show is that the older people in the FBI don't respect education. Ta-da! There's season one of Mindhunters. And he's like, no, I just want to go talk to some killers so I could think like one. And then they'll wind up in my lap everywhere I go. And that's exactly what happened throughout his career. This guy was on to something, man. Here I am out in Denver taking strangers on dinner dates when I really want to be picking the minds of an outlier or a serial killer. (laughs) 
I tried to take this prison class in my major, and in one of these, you would have got to go to a Delaware friggin' murder town, Wilmington, one of the state penitentiaries. I would have got to talk to some of these people. Instead, for my senior year summer for the University of Delaware, I was an indentured servant serf slave. I literally took a class four three credits where I worked a job, so I just paid off my own. De- I was a slave. And so I guess I got the credits or whatever, but I really would have been rather talking to killers and it would have came into a lot better hand broadcasting to a thousand plus people every month great looking out ud administration you got a good eye (laughs) so how do we get inside the mind of a killer it feels like we're there already the first killer he talked to was a 6-5 rapist murderer of five victims and he was a part-time ambulance driver so everybody thinks this kid is out there saving lives what a good dude he would drive to the ambulance calls pick up the girls do as he will with the body and leave them on the side of the highway and phone in a new ambulance call this is one of the first people john douglas got to talk to just a person you would think is a sweetheart in your town doing the absolute worst humane thing The first person he talked to was a complete, people suck, people suck. And so John Douglas in this interview admitted this was a foolproof criminal. Like if he was still on the streets as the ambulance, he would have never been able to catch this kid. So John Douglas admits that the FBI isn't perfect. There are killers that are going to be able to survive on the streets. And so going into the prisons, is the only way you're going to be able to find out about these people who are still out there succeeding. And something he learned just about the pathology of this killer was that he said rape was always on his mind and that he would always follow women around and fantasize capturing and killing them. And then he finally went through with it. And nobody caught him the first few times, so it just got worse and worse. And he realized, hey, this isn't too hard, and he kept doing it. And Douglas De- Douglas dug deep, <laughs> say that ten times fast, Doug dug deep enough to find that this guy was actually guilty for his rape and murders. This guy was caught by visiting the grave site of one of his victims. So the killers at the highest level who are smart enough to not get caught often have empathy. So this ambulance 6'5 white dude killer was visiting the grave sites of his victims because he felt bad and john douglas put this in his tool belly throughout the book he was always trying to catch people at the grave site <laughs> he's just like a girlfriend trying to trying to get the boyfriend to cheat on them and walk in on it to, oh my life is a drama <laughs> he puts like stuffed animals on grave sites in a lot of these cases throughout the rest of the book it's a good play i guess not every killer is into that they're all different and this is the first one he had to deal with and through this interview john learned that serial offenders are the new thing like i said before it's not the systematic whacking so that you could distribute moonshine throughout chicago it's just whack jobs that go to school and think kill everybody is the best option rather than drop out And the thing is, it's not just the kids shooting up schools. These are the sociopaths with empathy that John is hunting down. He's going for the craziest of the minds. For the latter half of chapter one, he posed the idea that the old tales of monsters, like the mythological tale of Hansel and Gretel, probably a pedophile tale, some old person luring a kid in their house with candy, uh, Dracula, friggin' a blood sucker it's probably just about a serial killer on the loose and big bad wolf about hot hooking up with hot chicks in the forest don't be a young hot girl walking around alone these old tales are probably just about these serial offenders that are on the loose that john was always hunting and i alluded to this before there was that 1950s they called him the mad bomber in new york city and in the span of 15 years he, he had a pretty good life. He was doing his bombings and he was free for 15 years. He bombed 30 sites in New York City, including Grand Central Station, Penn Station, Radio City Music Hall. This guy was hitting his marks. People have 
always been crazy, you know. And John, although he had that super jurisdiction to go anywhere in the world, all he did was locate the killers. He would never have to make the arrest. But he would also aid that in making the case against them because they would always have their defense doctor on trial who would say, oh, we're pleading insanity. But when your crimes are that clean, you're tying every single loose end so no detective can find you, it's pretty hard to plead insanity. And so the fact that John Douglas never had to make any of the arrests, he was just kind of like carted around the country to take a look at the cases, was him like being one of those seances those chicks that think they can reach the ethereal world and to find out who the killer is or where the lost child is that's kind of like john douglas and the mad bomber from new york city the way he was caught that was the story it was a guy from brussels and he said exact quote look for a heavy man middle-aged foreign-born roman catholic he will be single living with a sibling and when you find him he will have a double-breasted suit buttoned he went down to the detail of how this dude was going to be wearing his threads. It makes no sense. These guys are freaking seances. They have seen so many of these cases. They just know where it's going. It's like the freaking experienced micers, man. They just know where the set's going to be going before it's already happening. You just get on the frequency when you've been doing it enough. And that's what Douglas is saying. Get through the suck. <laughs> and John Douglas wraps up chapter one, disproving my magic. It's called behavioral science. They were able to reverse engineer the behavior of what a bomber would probably look like. And that's how the Brussels guy was able to make this description. How would someone pull off this many bombings? You can't have a family. You would need to have an alibi. And somebody who's wearing a double-breasted coat <laughs> living with their parents, like he said, yeah, you got enough time to go pull off some bombings, I guess. <laughs> that's good reverse engineering and behavioral science put together so just like that why plus how equals who done it a lot of people have hunches when watching murderer shows but john douglas actually has to pull the trigger you can't just guess one person on the show and if you're wrong oh well when john douglas pointed a wrong finger people would go to jail or be executed <laughs> and he had an extremely high success rate of convicting people for life sentences on a government salary. So this guy is really a saint on earth. He did some of the best work. He made this best-selling novel, gets to cash out for 25 years off of it. Well deserved. And he, <laughs> he did the deep dive. He went inside the mind of a killer. That'll take us to chapter two. My mother's name was Holmes, humble brag chapter we got here, talking about how his mom's maiden name was Holmes, like Sherlock, because around any detective precinct in the country, being referred to as Sherlock Holmes is like the highest compliment you can receive. You're solving cases left and right, causing a lot of civil asset damage in the process, blowing up unnecessary things that taxpayers have to foot the bill for. Just like Sherlock Holmes, these detectives have to be good at storytelling because you have to build a narrative. And that's what Sherlock Holmes would do. He would paint those pictures. Hmm, I pose that a five foot four man walked in this room smoking Cuban tobacco, and as he stabbed Madame Chardonnay in the bosom, he twisted the lead pipe. You gotta be a storyteller to be able to be a detective you're not going to come up with these elaborate stories of this killer undressed this woman tied her to a tree lacerated her and then redressed her before putting him in his trunk like why would you think that erratically like a killer to do those things in those steps you got to try to build a narrative as good as sherlock holmes story <laughs> so like the dutch cop who created the character for the bomber that's literally all that guy did he sat up at night writing a cigarette being like hmm <laughs> what would a new york bomber look like that's all he did sent it over to the nypd and got credited with catching the bronx bomber and something that john was really interested in as a kid he talked about in the book was he learned from the joker loved batman and robin and he learned from playing football that even if someone is stronger than you if you're crazier than them you win people are scared of the crazy like i said before embracing the crazy could be a power those people in the streets that'll rip their shirt off before a street fight that'll scare a lot more people off 
Douglas went to school in Montana and was a sig ep up there. And he had some really good college stories. He was a bouncer for a few summers, and that's where he learned not to overindulge in the booze, any chemicals. Because as a bouncer, you see people on their worst nights. That's who you're dealing with night after night. So he got that red pill of, okay, I don't need to be getting fucked up on booze that hard. But with his frat bros, he was getting into plenty of trouble. He got in a duo hot pursuit with one of his brothers. He was able to get away, he said, but the cops found him after. And he said what any smart kid would. He was playing his story. He said, oh, I was just a hostage in the car. The police officer couldn't do anything about it. And he was like, I don't know who the other kid was. Like, I just told you I was a hostage. What are they going to dig into your story? The FBI can hold that on his friggin' permanent record forever. So, justice on both sides, or really blackmail on both sides. But I love seeing this here. Chapter 2, he's talking about being friggin' Sherlock Holmes. He was on both sides of the law, though, so he knows what it's like to be pursued. Back at school in Delaware, he was up in Montana. In Delaware, <laughs> I'm sure more densely populated, more police. We were running from the cops at least four times a month at parties. This is how most party animals got their only workouts and god is that a rush have you ever fucking ran away from a 400 pound police officer holding their belt while almost a thousand drunk 20 year olds are sprinting out into the streets over train tracks throwing booze in the air that's when the party really starts it's a literal stampede of drunk and well-dressed kids my buddy won saint patty's day at school on the same day he saw a girl get tased and then another girl get hit by a car. Anarchy! That is anarchy. That is what fucking both sides of the law looks like. And so it's good to have these towns in America where you can cut loose completely. This isn't where the serial killers are coming out of. This is where the serial killers go. Jeffrey Dahmer referred to his uh, college campuses as a playground where he would go to pick up girls. That's creepy, man. No, normal kids just go get drunk and run from cops there. That's not the real problem. These cops need to be looking for the Delaware killers. In this book, John Douglas found some killers over on I-95 and shit. It's weird. <laughs> Those campus PD need to get their head out of their ass. Kids are going to drink, okay? Some people are going to kill. So focus on that, please. <laughs> To progress the narrative, he applied for the military after college, which then he was able to get like his 75% of his tuition paid for retroactively. Smart dude, but then he had to go spend time in eastern New Mexico, which he was talking about hating. This was like his hell to pay because he got all D's in college, so they were like, we're going to give you this shit, but we'll pay for it. He was able to hide in New Mexico until Vietnam wound down. And he just figured I might as well go for my master's so that I don't get drafted. And so he's technically a veteran because he was getting educated from the Air Force. And he ground out that master's of psychology while he said he lived in an apartment, I'm salty, for $7 a week. Dog, if I could be paying $28 a month in rent, I would have nine Netflix comedy specials. What the fuck is this, man? What were people doing all day back there? You have to come up with $28 a month for rent? Fuck old people for walking uphill both ways to school. It seems like you guys were getting drunk a whole lot more than I get to. <laughs> Some bullshit. $7 a week. I would have 10 masters. Literally $1 a day for rent. <sighs> <laughs> if you can't make a dollar a day you're a vegetable i am triggered he also said he was 25 pounds over the limit at the time for the air force and this was also because he was six foot two so he was literally doing anything he could to not get drafted to vietnam getting educated getting fat do what you got him in i respect the hell out of that but then he was finally recruited <laughs> gets to leave new mexico to go to quantico virginia and train to be in the fbi so let's move along here. Mr. Holmes, he will be eventually talking a little bit about his past, getting us to chapter three. We'll move into the time into his early years and the FBI boot camp years. Chapter three, betting on raindrops. You'll see where that title comes in later. He says that FBI agents, he started the chapter with an interesting point. FBI agents are taught to shoot to kill. So if you draw your weapon, 
you've already decided to kill someone you can't not shoot this is like in some states if you have a revolver and if you shoot a burglar in your home if you cocked the hammer back on the pistol before you shot this intruder in your home they consider this premeditative murder because it adds a little bit of firepower to the shot so you're thinking about killing this person in your home before you actually do it that's bullshit it's just the state mucking up ways for you and your lawyer to have to pay to get out of getting somebody out of your home no you killed an intruder that's it state get out of this situation you're not involved i'll bury the body in my backyard and it'll very much provide nutrition to my plants thank you for the fertilizer intruder <laughs> And being an FBI agent, basically this little metaphor was you always got to be thinking a step ahead. And killers are always a step ahead. You got to be thinking, where is this person's family going to be that night? Where am I going to put their body so the family doesn't see it? How are they going to be reacting to a missing person? All of this is in the killer's mind before they commit the act. In 1971, he gets sent to Detroit great time to be a police officer in detroit and they tell him two things they give him a revolver and they show him the guaranteed fastest route out of the city in case of emergency and they were basically like go ahead us versus them mentality go find some crime in detroit in 1971 it won't be hard they were having competitions in his precinct like they didn't even have beats to patrol it was literally just who could make the most arrests in a day and so john was not liking this he's saying like I didn't just sign up for the FBI to be friggin' playing a game of ruining people's lives who are betting on sports games that I have to arrest while me and our buddies are betting on raindrops going down the windshield because we're bored. Everybody's doing this shit. It's just the drape of the law it classifies you as a criminal and you as a ugh, someone who's running a religion rather than a cult. It's just laws. And he started to realize this even though he's on the FBI side. And so he's going, I don't give a fuck about putting people away who are making bets with their bookies. I want to be hunting killers who are really harming society. And so John's an educated guy. He saw above the average beat cops mentality of us versus them. Something that played into this was John got his gun stolen. The first month on the job, he got his fucking firearm stolen. That's the most incompetent, retarded thing you could do if you're a police officer. Get your gun stolen. If you find a free gun, I shouldn't be telling you this. I could go to jail. If you find a gun, man, that is a free murder. No serial number, no bullet serial number could be traced back to you. You literally have a free murder. Obviously, you can't fucking plan a date with your wife that night. <laughs> put a bullet in her head and they'll be like hmm i wonder who was hanging out with mrs muniz that night <laughs> gun isn't always a free murder but absolutely in 1971 detroit it's six free murders john lost his revolver <laughs> i'm sure you've heard the best getaway car is a stolen one it's the same concept <laughs> why was i in criminal justice as a major i think i just learned how to be a better criminal and i didn't even go to prison <laughs> But this put a huge red mark on Douglas's like record that he can't be a sheriff now because he did such a stupid thing as a youngling that people can always see this on his permanent record. And so he's like, this is really dumb. I need to go through the FBI channels to get my own unit. And he was a freaking entrepreneur within the FBI to get his own funding to do his own studying and then hire his own people to go interview murderers. He literally just did whatever he wanted with government money. It's pretty badass. So that was kind of the concept of the betting on raindrops. He's a scammer of his own, man. He just went through the FBI channels to scam the right officers into giving him money to study what he wants to and it was a productive thing so like i said when people have free time and money they don't just go evil he went the opposite of evil and hunted it and the big story from the chapter was that he was about to do a sting operation on super bowl sunday and his partner just slapped five dollars on the dashboard and like they always did they were putting some bets on raindrops 
<laughs> they were putting bets on no athletes, nothing, just a literal chance. And they were about to go bust $50,000 worth of a gambling ring and ruined husbands and fathers' lives. And John was like, I don't want to do this sting. He was sitting in the car and was like, I hope these criminals get away. And not only realizing that we are gambling just like these people, but tomorrow, this gambling ring is just going to fill up with 20 new people who want to gamble or need to try to risk their money to make rent this month. You're not doing good by putting away nonviolent offenders. John realized this. A little more of a philosophical chapter there, but a nice little change-up. And it'll bring us to chapter 4 here. He is what he calls Between Two Worlds. He's kind of in Detroit, and he's also getting back to school. Already has a master's, getting some more. But he's really studying what he wants here. Because the first time you go to school, you hear this from people who have multiple masters. It's kind of like you are just there to get the degree. Facts. But nobody has money to go put themselves $200,000 in debt again. Bernie, where's that free college at? Ruin our economy. <laughs> In Detroit, John was held at gunpoint for the first time, and it was in an, like an interest theft case of $100,000, and this will be one of the most times you ever feel alive. You're looking down the barrel of a loaded gun, literally, and he said this was a big influencer for that two years of experience. He said it feels like it kind of fast-tracked him because he put himself in a situation he wasn't ready for. No one will ever be ready to look down the barrel of a loaded gun. But he was put in that situation, and he didn't crumble. He learned and grew from it. And John Douglas wasn't only disliking how the Detroit detective system was, just us versus them. Even in the FBI... He was seeing that the old timers in the bureau, their mentality was you get paid the same if you put yourself out on a limb or if you don't. So you should probably bury your head in the sand to get your paycheck and go home and not cause a wave. But John's idea was, <laughs> why don't we get better at what we do here? Go try to learn and catch even more violent people that are not on our radar. And so it wasn't a while until the FBI implemented this merit-based system that he was crucial in getting instilled. And the merit system was finally, the more work you do, the more money you get. Whoa, government, did you hear that? Don't give the DMV money when their user reviews are negative stars. Tell them, get your fucking act together or you're not going to have a job and see how many of them treat people like garbage still. It, reverse incentives. John was pointing that out in the FBI. And so he exploited this. He was able to get approved for funding to go back to school. And he was a teacher's pet. You could see this portrayed in the series. He uses the FBI funding to just go play around with 1970s professors and talk about, you know, Emil Durkheim, Fyodor Dostoevsky, all those people who were talking about crime and punishment in the olden days. He was sitting on the professor's lap <laughs> for all that. And he says between these two worlds, he learned how crime is an illness of an unwell society. That's what he thinks. He doesn't just think bad people on the streets that we have to go catch he's thinking there's poor people with terrible parents that are beating them and he sees this in the most extreme cases that's what creates the murderers it's a criminology degree he got on top of his masters he's learning the philosophy behind crime where it's kind of an illness of an unwell society so at this time he's got a bunch of degrees to be a police officer, you literally just needed to graduate high school. And so not only did he tour around the country trying to interview murderers, he went to precincts and gave them lectures about how, like I just said, the crackhead on the corner is definitely there due to circumstance just as much as to the fact that he wanted to try crack once. He probably had the worst life ever, and now he tried crack, and it just compounded how bad that shit was for him. Is that my responsibility? No. But is it the responsibility of some friggin' high school grad football player who put on a cop uniform to go crack that crackhead skull? Absolutely not. I am more on the side of the crackhead in that sense. Non-aggression principle. 
So even while he was getting a degree, it was in the 70s, people were in this hippie mode and they thought he was a narc and he's between these two worlds. That's why it's so divisive for him. He's living with hippies and working with the exact opposite, the enemy, the pigs. He met his wife Pam there though in Michigan. His wife, hippie chick as portrayed in the show, he was five years older than her though. He's 29, she's 24 at the time. He saw all that Detroit BS and she's just a little college girl that is spitting the books, the psalms back at him while he has actually seen the gore of the streets. Douglas literally hit the lottery here. A loyal hippie chick that's rich. (laughs) and so he got reassigned to milwaukee and she moves there with him but he got an apartment three blocks away from the precinct which he thought was going to be a good idea you know world's shortest commute no any time the precinct needed help they were like oh let's get douglas on it he's two minutes away but it's milwaukee he's not in detroit anymore he was talking about how beat the beat was it was dead his superiors were just telling him dude go get out of the office and go get a coffee like just don't be in our face right now go act like you're doing work so he would go to the library and just read shit he would read some more criminology and everyone in the precinct thought that he was a big flaming queer for you know spending his time in the stacks and he was a liberal as well in this time which doesn't go over well with police officers and he was still single at 30 so he's just in a shit position that's why he felt even more alienated from the police culture the blue brotherhood he just went and did his own friggin' thing end of chapter four he's transitioning out of the between two worlds married to pam living in milwaukee she's a middle school teacher hoover's dead nixon's in he goes into a deep depression he says for his six months responding to violent murders and this is because he's seeing now the most heinous crime scenes he's seen the blood on the walls the gray brain matter splattered on the ground (laughs) it's about to start getting graphic Although within these first six months, he hit a deep depression, he got one of his first nuggets, which is that serial killers, killers that kill multiple times, will often have a signature or like something that connects their crimes. Think about it. Serial in a row. They're doing this as an act, as a masterpiece, (laughs) as an album, man. They're putting together a track list of their kills. It's creepy how these people like talk about their kills as memories, as their book their theater their coloring book and it's 1975 douglas is a seasoned detective and he is getting into some negotiations he's a dad so not only is he negotiating with kids about carrots instead of cheetos for dinner he is getting more experience as a head negotiator chapter five is up aptly named behavioral science or bs all these people who think These dumb young liberals just go to college to waste their money. It's true. Was John Douglas's degree that he was using FBI money to learn about behavior? We learned through his writings and experiences that that came out to be useful. But if you never apply the knowledge, if you spend your entire life as a teacher in the ivory towers, if you're an anthropology teacher and you literally never go to Africa to help these people that you're yelling at the young white kids about how they're destroying their land... What have you done? You've just filled 18-year-olds' minds with poop. Well, I guess that's my take off the bat. Sorry for that tangent. (laughs) Again, John's still moving away from the law, so goes to tell you where he thinks the behavioral science really lies. But he's done with those drug sting ops and infiltrating gangs. And so his higher-ups are letting him know, John, it's time to apply this fancy book knowledge that you keep running away. Talk down to us now about... Otherwise, you're not proving any return on investment. And so John says, give me a shot. And his higher ups put him in the hostage negotiator position. He's the head negotiator. Netflix did a pretty good job at emphasizing this part of his career. And if you just go literally the first episode, first scene of the show is him trying to bargain with a guy who's holding a lady and a shotgun. Winds up shooting his own head off. The whole dialogue shows how Douglas is very calculated with his words and everything he says is a negotiation whereas 
Hey, what's going on in there? You don't just walk up to the hostage crazy person asking him how the weather is or whatever. You have to have a plan. And the show showed how Douglas uses every bit of leverage they have in that split second situation. Douglas kept emphasizing this like Swedish bank robber case that he had learned about th in school. So none of the other police officers or negotiators knew about it. And the point of that whole lesson was how this Swedish robber was able to, he was like some good looking dude. So all of the bank teller ladies who are secretly living out one of their sexual fantasies, the way this Swedish bank robber got away was through Stockholm syndrome. I'm pretty sure that's where it originated, Stockholm, Sweden. They, like, love this bank robber. They were like, you're the coolest person ever, and you just rob banks? This guy was, of the three, one of the professionals. He was, he, Suavo knew what he was doing. The hostages, they switched sides. They went with the crazy person and just left with the money with him. And so what John learned through this awesome case that he filled a lot of ink on the pages with was how if you can get an inside person, start communicating with one of the hostages or just have a plant in there, you are golden. <laughs> it's like the surveillance thing, man. If you know where the opposition is moving, you could squash it a step ahead. I remember one of my, I guess there really is some value. I'm, I trashed college education up front, but this will stay with me forever in one of my criminology classes. No, it was the fucking woman's studies class. It, <laughs> I didn't even watch this in one of the police officer training classes. That's the most retarded thing I've just thought about. This lady made us watch a video of a cop who was forcibly had to suck a dick like the robber had a gun the cop wasn't able to pull his sidearm in time so he would put it up to the guy's temple i'll never forget this video it was in like a 50 year old man with a white mustache crying and he's like the, the head of that penis was so red and he just shoved it in and out of my mouth and i was drooling and i was like oh my god can i go to the bathroom Teacher's like, no, that's male privilege. I'm like, I identify as a female. It's, I'm on my period. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> this video was fucking heinous, man. But I don't care. You took the oath. The past 50 years, while you were growing that white mustache, you were locking up nonviolent offenders, fucking tariffing people for just driving. I wish every person he gave a life sentence for weed got to watch this man suck off a criminal i literally didn't feel bad for him but it was disgusting this guy was a fucking broken man you don't recover from some shit like that so yeah that was definitely not behavioral science that was bullshit that was one man's opinion on how he dealt with go to therapy why are you talking into a camera about this <laughs> that's gonna be the first comment but in context about this show <laughs> Linking this to Douglas, in 1976, he was saying he saw some of his first real gore. Like severed heads, bodies hanging upside down with parts cut out for use, people chained up at the feet, not able to leave basements and stuff. He was scarred at this point. He saw the cop video. He, You can't go back after these types of things. So he moved to Quantico, gets an estate with his girl. Remember, they're married. They have a kid. He's balling out in Virginia. And he is about to enter the behavioral science unit, which he later gets to call the ISU when he takes it over. And I'll meld this next chapter in. It's just about how he was taking the show on the road. They portray it in the Netflix series, just him and one of the older guys they go along with. And, you know, he's a, he's a real blue-collar, roughneck guy. But I've been doing it the old-fashioned way. So he has to get his little queer academic points across throughout the show. The show is a little freaking choppy in that sense. It's like, you know... You know what they're going to say, but it's entertaining because there are copious amounts of gore. <laughs> and at this time when John joined, there were only nine other agents in the behavioral science unit. It was extremely selective. They knew he was negotiating hostages, seeing gruesome stuff. He did the legwork at the start, so they gave him this top position. And the goal of this unit is to answer why do violent criminals think and act as they do. So behavioral science comes into a very good use here it might not do much as a beat cop where you're playing a game of trying to score points and dunk on civilians <laughs> as a in this fbi unit he's asking the bigger questions trying to find out why do criminals do what they do 
You hear it a million times, man. Cops are just like the nerds in their high school who finally got out of high school and realized, oh, okay, the jocks are just going to go get married and do nothing, so now I could get power and bully those jocks. It's just like a little switch. So John removed himself from the game. He saw it. And so there's only 10 people in the unit. He's using that funding to travel the country and talk to small precincts and give lectures. Did a lot of teaching on armed robberies and how to like react without immediate violence and what you should do is have like i was saying have a plant inside before like have a secret code with you and the other people like if i only blink with my right eye ever that means one of the people in here is about to rob the place or a literal plant you could just like have a sunflower in the corner and turn it 90 degrees when you think something is up it's just like these little codes that you can have and the bank robberies usually happen in the early morning which is counterintuitive. Everyone thinks rush hour for the coolest Hollywood scene chase. No, it's usually like as soon as the bank opens, cops are still at Dunkin' Donuts. You have a big head start as soon as you trip the alarm. And John has seen it all by now, so he's telling these smaller precincts about the grossest things he has seen. He's talking about, like, murders of little boys, which... <laughs> at first he said the small town cops would laugh at but it would be less than a minute until you could turn people's laughter into convulsion talking about how yeah little johnny's never gonna go home but his anus is also inside out due to a 40 year old creeps cock yeah that's not gonna make anybody laugh if you're laughing out there the fbi is coming for you <laughs> they're already on me so you got a little crowd work experience going too he talked about how he was a road dog, man. He was traveling Monday through Friday every week. He got a real picture of America, so I think this really did add to his perspective. He did this for two years, and then he said he got road sick, solving small town crimes in hotel rooms. That is not a glamorous life. And to wrap up chapter five... It was a big part of the first two seasons of Mindhunter the show. He caught some roadside killer in Colorado called Ed Kemper. It was in Pueblo out here. And this guy is massive. They show him in the show he's like 6'8", 300 pounds. But in real life, he had a massive IQ. He had like a 140 IQ, was stabbing people to death, taking them home to dissect them, sexually assault the bodies. He would leave their heads in ravines on the side of the roads, but like drive a few miles up, then throw it off to throw the cops off. He was breadcrumbing. He was doing everything he needed to. And in the show, they... <laughs> portray him as like a calculated killer and the information that he gives to john during the prison interviews is very selective as well and what john got to the bottom with the colorado killer kemper kemper had an abusive mom and sometimes in the middle of the night he would like not just stand in the doorway to tell his mom he had to throw up Kemper would go up to the side of his mom's bed with a hammer and just fucking fantasize about bashing her brains in and later on, you find out Ed got caught once he cut his mom's larynx out and put it in the garbage disposal. You know, for all the years that she was yelling at him, Shakespeare could not write that irony. These killers are artists. Who would think to cut someone's larynx out and shred it up? Maybe you after having to listen to me through a $2 microphone. And then he went on to have sex with the throat hole. And in the show, he describes it as a nice suck from a vacuum in the lungs you know yanks your meat down there this book was some real shit happy halloween so having that messed up parent <laughs> to go in their room with a hammer in the middle of the night is a really bad start and he learned through other serial rapists murderers their motivations is just like domination manipulation and control he didn't have any of that as a kid he was just being screamed at just like I said before, people that felt like losers in high school need to feel like they have to go out and get the power to bully the chads. <laughs> and a lot of the people that are serial rapist murderers John bought up were rejected for police or just basic security positions. These people try to obtain small levels of power. And it's not hard to realize people want these little... Dude, I see it near i worked in a very rich area for a while and <laughs> no i don't need to trash people i know go to a mall and look at a mall cop done 
And I'll take it a step further here. I've done the research. If you look at almost every single mass shooter, Nick Cruz from Florida, the El Paso, Texas Walmart shooter, the friggin' older guy that shot up Sandy Hook, not only were they all on pharmaceutical drugs, they were all, you're not ready for this shit, they were all in Patriot Youth Programs. Do you know what a sleeper agent is? It's a, literally watch a James Bond movie, anything about the Cold War. Patriot youth programs, you get fucking carted out. You really don't remember like 99% of your childhood. <laughs> these mass shooters, these people that try out for police security positions have been reported to be in Patriot youth programs. Just like Ed Kemper, Mr. Friggin' Boy Scout. You don't learn that knifesmanship without having a pedophile older man show you those ropes. That's right, baby. <laughs> Forgot the soundboard for a minute there. So what did we learn from Ed in chapter 5? John said, if you want to understand an artist, look at his work. He had to look at all of Ed's roadside killings, see all the heads in the ravines to connect it back to him. So John got to do some interviews while he was touring the country. Goes back to Quantico and secures a $400,000 grant to study criminals for the DSM around Quantico. That's how doctors classify people with mental illnesses. And he's studying criminals for that. It's kind of a big job. Chapter 6, The Heart of Darkness. More of his murder interviews. And John wonders why were some of these men so eager to talk to law enforcement while some of them were just living out the rest of their life in jail. They don't need to give up their trade secrets. Take that shit to the grave like a gangsta. <laughs> and John thought in, like, Ed Kemper's case, the Colorado killer, Ed felt sorry. Like, he had empathy. He's one of these higher-level killers. So he wanted to relive those experiences through an interview, showing that maybe the highest-level killers know that their story is going to get out eventually and they want to tell it themselves not have some dingus reporter who just got a few tips from the police officers no you have to go into a state penitentiary and talk to a killer to know how they actually got the work done this is why i have respect for douglas and it helped him too doing these little interviews on his own time he was in illinois for a stretch and there was a mass murder on the loose and the guy behind bars basically told him who the killer was just like silence of the lambs you have to go to hannibal lecter to find buffalo bill because in real life too these killers run in small circles they're like oh yeah i did a stint of crime i did a skinning same thing with george merman back in the 80s and he found george merman here in illinois nickname murder man and up until John Douglas in this FBI unit, nobody knew to go talk to other criminals to try to get answers. They just thought, those are bad apples that we need to let rot in a cage. <laughs> and John starts thinking, most of these mass killers are geniuses. Like Kemper had 140 IQ. They are smart enough to not get caught. So maybe it is subconscious or I think a lot of them honestly give up. Because that is a lot of stress, a lot of... You're putting on an act every day, but if you're a killer, you have to put on a super act. You have to be literally the world's best actor on top of the world's best killer. No wonder these people are freaking geniuses, for real. But John thinks maybe they subconsciously start getting lazy with their kills because they want to get caught. He knows more than I do. There was a guy who murdered eight nurses in Chicago, and he was interviewed and was like, I'm different than the other killers, but they all say that. But John thought this one was worse in particular because it was a characterized mass murder. He was profiling young nurses. It's not just an impulse kill or, you know, stabbing your wife for f burning the meatloaf. <laughs> this guy was hunting young nurses. He had a type. <laughs> In this heart of darkness after Illinois, he was doing a little more biological reading. And apparently, the reason that men are more successful than women, truth. The reason men fill up prisons more than women, truth. Look at the bell curve. Men are further on the outskirts. We just outlie harder. We outlie worse a lot more, too. Dudes suck, but fucking like i say women stay in line you run with the pack if you run in a group you get the results of a group 
men is a much more blind throw at a dartboard for genetics when you're giving birth. It's like f fucking wherever it goes, that's the dude you get. <laughs> and John found out a lot of men have a second Y chromosome. Also, another thing you should probably know of being a human being, we all start out as girls. That's why I have nipples. I'm touching them right now. <laughs> And then the male fetuses develop a Y chromosome and grow a dick out of your clitoris. And then John is saying a small amount of men develop a second Y chromosome. So it's another level of development. This often leads to freaking ADHD, autism. It's not a good thing. Cellular mutation. It's just like a... <laughs> so now you're throwing the dartboard at the dartboard, taking 10 steps back and doing a full... MLB wind up to the mound when you throw this thing. <laughs> that's the second Y chromosome, and that's what a lot of these killers are. They have a little sprinkle of the autism in there. They have a little anger management. They have some cellular mutation. They're <laughs> like Ed Kemper, 6'8 and 300 pounds. Literal mutants walk among us mentally and physically. <laughs> I just thought that part was pretty cool about these 2% of psychos with the second Y chromosome. But we all have nipples, so I guess that's something men, women, and chicos have in common. <laughs> Some more of these psychos to wrap up the chapter that John met with, a guy named Jerry Brudos. He was chopping people's feet off around the University of Virginia, and Douglas thinks he got down to the root. He thinks he's a psychologist more than a detective. He's going, ah, oh, yes, this man was into, he had a high heel fetish when he was younger because his mom made him go through the dump, and one day he found a pair of high heels in there for him and his mom was really happy and so apparently that led to him cutting off feet 30 years later sure dude <laughs> i'm thinking there was a lot more shitty stuff going on in this guy's life <laughs> if you hold on to some magic high heels you inherit a foot fetish that's fucking jumanji logic man is there some voodoo thing in my room maybe there's some magic high heels that made jerry brudos cut chick's feet off but John also said that this dude, Jerry, was peeling paint chips off of his prison cell and eating them. So are we sure it was the shoes, Mr. Douglas? That's poetic and all, but this guy literally had lead in his brain. I'm thinking he probably had a chip-eating habit in his old house, and it carried over to his prison cell as well. We got Bob Ressler. He was an Oregon State killer. A lot of these killers hang out around colleges, too. He would dress girls up in a dress and then hang them by the neck and put a mirror under their swaying body and have a photo shoot. Nice little hanging corpse with a swaying vagina. Not for me. I, my penis literally went inside of my body when I just said that. Who would think to do that? I know of kids in middle school who would put their phone with the camera going on the ground so when a girl would walk by in a skirt there you go a nice little immortal tale of grubby little boys for you it's these killers that take this shit to the next level like i'm saying i would do bonfires out in the woods with my friends these guys would burn people over the bonfires just moderation <laughs> everything in moderation even your kills and john douglas caught wrestler's face the guy who was hanging girls with the mirrors he took a picture and his face was in the mirror there was like a double reflection that douglas saw that would be a really good end to a csi so all of these guys increase their mutilations of the corpses upon the kills so the first one maybe you just you kill a girl stab her 40 times to death and then you give her a nice little smooch. Ooh, that was a fun night. And then tomorrow night, you're sitting at your desk, sweating profusely, staring at the wall, thinking, what the fuck just happened? I'm a killer now. Well, tomorrow night, after you kill another person, to calm that anxiety again. <laughs> this time, you're going to make out with her. And next time, second base, third base, you get the point. John Douglas figured this out. And to end this chapter, The Heart of Darkness... This story shows how John's in the heart of darkness. He caught this guy in New York City called David Berkowitz, who as a kid went to juvenile detention and a fucking security guard pushed his neck and pushed him into a wall and smashed his throat from behind. Had to get reconstructive surgery and was just like mad at the world, killing people since then. Wouldn't you be too, man? It's literally the criminal justice system making their own enemies. That's all it is. People that offend re-offend. You don't start being a criminal when you're 25, dude. 
and the New York Daily News article written the next day after John caught him, it was just like a classic stalker case. He caught him literally in the act of stalking another woman. He triangulated who we thought the next kill would be, and that's how he found the killer. Again, super smart detective. The Daily News article written about Douglas said, in a hundred years, nobody's gonna remember John Douglas, but people are gonna remember the son of Sam, aka Berkowitz. He was like the son of Sam killer. But that little journalist was right. People want to hear this gruesome story. Nobody's going to care about the guy doing the necessary work for our society to catch him. And luckily, Douglas was able to write this book. So now, yes, he is a legend as well. But point being, John got to the heart of darkness because he realized, fuck, I'm doing all this good work catching these people and no one even remembers me. They remember them? That sucks. So he also profiled 115 women. Women women in these heart of darkness chapter things so don't call me a misogynist chapter seven the killer will have a speech impediment i started this chapter with a part that was also in the netflix series if you watched it it was about like the dog strangler there was a guy that was he would slash old women's throats and then strangle their dog and Douglas was able to use Ed Kemp, the Colorado killer's help, to find this kid by finding a common denominator. And the common denominator was they just had to find like a 30 year old dude living with his mom still, an old lady, profile of the kills, who had an annoying dog. And that's exactly where they found this killer. Douglas and his partner just went to a trailer park, listened for a yelping Pomeranian dog found an old lady smoking cigarettes and some cuck of a son that opened the door for her and they were like yep this guy probably strangles puppies and they found out through a five minute interview with the kid he broke down pretty quick i hate my mom so i kill people like her and then strangle the dogs that annoy me because i hate my mom's dog as well and of course kids still living with his mom at 30 strangling puppies had a speech impediment so we're still profiling killers here in chapter seven but a common denominator here is that they, if people can't talk i guess <laughs> there was a guy called the trail side killer that would leave women's heads on the side of the trail but take their body so kind of like ed kemp you know just leaving heads in ravines but this is on a nice lovely hike you think you see whoa is that a large spore mushroom over there growing in the forest that's a woman's head he ruins hikes, he ruins people's lives, and he gets away with it. They found gray hair at one of the crime scenes, so they think the killer may be an older guy. Not <laughs> not Sherlock Holmes detective work there, pretty standard. And Douglas predicts he's an asocial guy, an asocial killer, because he's taking lives out in the wilderness. Unlike Bundy, who was able to lure chicks into his car, this guy was probably antisocial. He had to get his kills done on the trails. <laughs> And eventually someone spotted his car, and it wound up being an older, registered California sex offender shut-in. So Douglas hit that Belgium savant guess, the seance guess, <laughs> savant. And he hit the nail on the head. As soon as he saw the white hair, he's like, antisocial old sex offender who wants to cut young ladies' heads off. <laughs> that is the trailside killer. What we learned from the trailside killer there was that this old man... Some people go through their entire life with a stutter. This old man found the cure. You just have to kill people. He said after his first murder and execution, his stutter went away. So opposite of what I was saying before, maybe the stutter comes out in some people that can't suppress it, but these higher level 140 IQ killers, they find cures. They cope with a life through their killings. It's some next level shit. <laughs> Douglas is making some big catches all over the country and he finally gets acknowledged by the bureau that the behavioral science unit is of value so behavioral science or BS they finally gave it to him you got a lot of gross people off the street so thank you let's get a few more of these speech impediment killers in because they were pretty entertaining there was the underpants head killer you ever run around when you were five years old with underpants on your head do that at 40 and take a life and you'll be a legend they found DNA <laughs> <laughs> to suggest that the guy was black and <laughs> you're like that's some white dude shit man he's running around with underpants on his dead raping and killing chicks no black dudes doing that <laughs> john pulled another savant 
trick out of his ass to catch the underpants head killer he goes this man will be 35 unemployed male nocturnal single and within a mile of the kills most importantly he will be on pharmaceutical drugs yet have a suicide attempt how weird is that the people on drugs have more suicide attempts than the people that aren't on drugs i don't even want to address that right now <laughs> I fucking concluded this, though. If you try to take your own life, how far are you from being able to take someone else's? It's kind of badass. You are that much closer to being a killer, I guess. <laughs> and John Douglas did find the guy was a janitor, and he was black, so it matched the DNA. But, 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 he did not have a speech impediment. So, again, it's never going to be 100%, and that's why it's so hard to convict it's hard to freaking put someone in jail when you think you have the checklist, but it's not always there. And John has a high success rate at this point. And so Douglas knows what he's done at this point has led him to success. And he takes another step. John Douglas starts going into psychiatric wards to try to explore a new level of creativity. These are like other killers that just would like smear poop on the walls and then get caught like they're not methodical but maybe the story behind their kills what led them to that is another pattern that he can try to identify and he got recognized for this too man i'm too scared when i volunteered at a hospital i avoided the psych unit as hard as possible you like got near the doors and you would hear people screaming oh my god we have the <laughs> literally that type of shit and i was like 15 years old just trying to put some volunteer hours in and i'm like oh my god please don't make me change their bedpans john douglas was freaking dissecting and hunting these people's minds and going into this level of spookage halloween awesomeness this is what got john douglas recognized as the inspiration for the silence of the lambs the movie it was a 1983 psychology today article so John Douglas out here making strides. That'll take us to chapter 8, Walking in the Shoes. So now he's really learning, after going to the crazy house, he's really learning to think on the frequency of a killer. And he's catching them left and right. It's the early 80s. He's doing about 150 cases a year. Imagine that. Every other day, a new murderer. A guy named Dr. James Luke is working alongside him, and he would deal with the corpses, and he has, like, the darkest sense of humor that John has ever known. You got to. You think Douglas has it bad? This guy has to friggin' autopsy the bodies and <laughs> try to dissect how they were killed. You don't even know how they were killed, and you have to look at a corpse to find that out. It's like in The Silence of the Lambs, that disgusting scene when they flip the cadaver over, and this 400-pound lady, they pull a butterfly cocoon out of her throat. <laughs> this is what Dr. James Luke had to do, and that's why he had such a sick sense of humor. Douglas said... Anytime James Luke came across a body, he would kick it as hard as he could and go, Oh, yep, that guy sure is dead. When you come across what you think is a killed enemy combatant on the battlefield, you are supposed to punt this person, okay, X person that your government identified as a villain, punt this guy as hard as you can in the ball sack to make sure he's dead because no man no matter how deep of a coma you are in if you get punted in the balls you are going to fucking cough spit up a nut do whatever and this is what james luke would do as a joke it's a good tool to see if you actually killed a burglar <laughs> so let's not let james luke kick it around my neck of the woods because i'm trying to leave a pretty corpse i want to have an open casket funeral i don't need to be bruised up by dr james luke <laughs> I not only want an open casket, I want a nude open casket funeral. I'm going to tell them to make my body get a pump before my funeral. <laughs> it's October. You're allowed to do these dark jokes. One of the way Dr. Luke said he would try to get to the bottom of a kill during his autopsies was, you have to imagine every yell, every thrust and cry of the victim to get a better picture of the kill. He has different but helpful patterns in his line of work that Douglas can adapt. And Dr. James Luke helped Douglas catch Murder Mac, 
which was a van murderer, a guy who would pretend to move furniture and then like have the girl take the backside and push her into the van. That was like the exact scene in The Silence of the Lambs. So like they just kind of for that movie they just kind of put a bunch of the killers from Douglas's career into one. So I guess he's not really walking in the shoes, he's more walking alongside Dr. James Luke here. <laughs> he ended that chapter talking about he solved a kill in Logan, Pennsylvania just by thinking like living a day he said he like woke up in a hotel room and friggin lived the day as he thought a killer would and it led to him in the same part of town logan pa yo <laughs> it might not be that hard to catch killers you're in a town with a population of 2,000 people literally just go get a few coffees throughout the day and this person will drive past you at some point <laughs> you're not in the middle of a city but douglas still caught a real live killer thinking and living out the daily life of a killer and i'm gonna smash the next chapter in with this one because it was he put pictures in the novel i was salty they were pictures of him of like his old childhood home and the chapter was called everybody has a rock and you know he's thinking in the mind of a killer he's in the dark place now so you gotta give him some breathing room He's got to freaking take a vacation. Yeah, you're solving 150 murders a year. Whole chapter, he's going, my family is my rock, and now I get to build my own new family with my wife and their kids. I'm just giving you the fun parts. <laughs> there was this story about how his mom, John's mom, one time asked him, mid-pizza in the middle of dinner, if he had gotten laid. John was 19 years old, and he was like, yeah, mom, I've gotten laid. And, like, just to start off, why are you asking this question? Why are you asking this at dinner? Why are you wondering this in the first place? And then his mom went on and said, multiple women. And John responded perfectly as I would. He went, yeah, mom, too many to count. <laughs> yeah, mom, I run a brothel. This is like when your mom would follow you into the doctor's office for the checkup. This was their one chance a year to hear if you were sexually active when your doctor asks. But Douglas's mom was brave enough to like ruin a family dinner and just bring up shit like that in the middle of it. And so John's going, my mom kind of messed with me a little bit. So maybe this led me to the line of work where I want to hunt killers. Again, one of his like Freud ideas about parenting leading to everything in your life that's i don't really like freudian psychology you can it's like conspiracy theorists for how your brain works you have an end goal that you want to prove and you're going from there these freud people just think yep whatever your parents did that's exactly why you act the way you do today it's like there are so many other factors and lines of behavioral psychology in your life what you do how you ingrain your brain every single day is a much more likely thing compared to how two people that lived with you treated you. So a little counter, there's both sides of the coin, me and Douglas's idea. <laughs> I did like the end of this part of the chapter. He was talking about how, okay, so maybe I'm in this line of work because I was Freudianly fucked up growing up, sure. But he bought up, then what explains the people who go legally kill in the middle east guys who we positively brainwash to go kill people we deem as threats why aren't they just killing people for fun douglas is going maybe it's because they have a rock like you're not going to be a navy seal if you didn't have a grandpa that was a navy seal and you weren't freaking told by the school that you need to go be a navy seal you have some sort of community or family support unit if you are going to deploy and fly overseas every two years to kill people. You have some sort of support unit here. And that's what Douglas is saying here. These people, the serial killers, don't have the rock. So they cannot put it in a box. This is killing time. This is not killing time. They get caught. Nobody, no crime. <laughs> Chapter 9, Atlanta. John Douglas did a stint at Atlanta. And in the 80s, as a lot of cities were, he was saying the city was under siege by criminals. In Atlanta, they were finding stabbings, beatings, like anonymous stabbings and beatings, not domestic abuses. They found a few child bodies, a strangled adult with a broken neck under a bridge. And the town, this is Atlanta in the 1980s, the town got a tip 
and it was apparently the killer breadcrumbing someone else. This is what smart killers do. And this is a fucking genius killer. He's playing the media. He turned his kill into a race war, basically. And Douglas said he was there for this. People were like, there needs to be justice for black people. There's a friggin' white maniac on the loose killing our black people. Just like, I'm gonna have to go deep, just like the KKK, they'll burn crosses on your yard. They will hang people from trees. They want their message to be seen. These killers want to mess around with their detective, leave little ransom notes and breadcrumb them elsewhere. They don't want to be in the news until they want to Ed Kemper and then tell their story 20 years later. Listen, I'm trying to give you a media tip here, really, is what's going on. <laughs> An individual kill like that from a serial killer is not motivated by race. Serial killers kill within their own race. So you will probably never have a white dude that's just out there rampantly killing black people. If it did exist, I would never hear the end of that. Like, I could just say, uh, I could not hold the door for a black person, and then they'll be like, Ed Kemper, Ed Kemper. Hey, 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 you're responsible for that guy to be like, oh, shit, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for slavery, I'm sorry for Ed Kemper. <laughs> but you get the point here. The media is trying to sow that type of division where they will put the puppet head, the Jesse Smollett, wherever they can. And Douglas found this out in 80s Atlanta. He was going, stop, stop the media right now. It's not a KKK member doing this. And so, like, people say everything is political nowadays. Everything's always been politicized, man. If you have influence, if you have a narrative, you're going to spin it. That is the media. It's not journalism. Douglas wound up arresting a 15-year-old Patrick Baltazar for the crimes. He just put him on trial and then got the fuck out of Atlanta. It was like, this, this one's above my pay grade. Like I was saying, <laughs> the best killers we'll never have heard of. Some crimes are too much for the 10-person FBI most elite unit. But Douglas did redeem himself in Atlanta. He caught a river killer, which every city has a river killer. I lived up in Boston for six months. They During the cold months, they're like, young men, make sure you go out in groups and do not get too drunk. Otherwise, your body will be in the Charles River. And the story they say is, oh, the kid was just drunk and he fell over then drowned. Do some research yourself. I've read a little bit about it. The smiley face conspiracy killer. Always young men. You get abducted on a night out. Maybe you get coaxed out by a woman who's somewhat of an agent. And she leads you to an alley with a bunch of goons who then do tests on you and dump you into a river. And in a lot of these cases, either the body or an area around just got goosebumps will have a smiley face spray painted. And that's like the fucking kill sign, man. Whatever. MK Ultra, Stranger Things, Operation Wormwood. There's a Netflix series on that one, too. MK Naomi. There are a lot of abduction and test cases. Whatever. That showed, like, some of those kills. Even John Douglas couldn't identify. It could be literally above his pay grade. It could be hobo experiments man <laughs> it's october if you want to spook yourself out this is the month to go look into some truth and i'll leave you there that's the point of this podcast i won't drown you in conspiracy i'll give you what you need to go look up douglas caught a river killer by doing like a massive stakeout they had like a parade for him through the city he was a hero but they only gave him a 250 fifty dollar reward and which works out to like nickels for the amount of time he spent staking out the actual river itself to catch this guy. And he's realizing again, you know, there's no money in this. He's kind of doing it for valor. But the big joke was they told you in FBI school, high risk, high gain. And it's basically just high risk with a low descent into madness. <laughs> there is no gain. He's not getting money. He's not getting to spend time with his family. <laughs> he's just doing amazing things for us. Bring us to chapter 10, one of our own. The FBI is taking casualties in this chapter. There was a new transfer in the unit who had like a rocky marriage, so nobody trusts him. And like nobody trusted Douglas because he was single until he was 30 reading books and shit. But he put a lot of work in and so people were like, oh fuck, he's catching killers. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll let you do your thing. And Judd, 
the new guy gets shot on the job when he was with Douglas. And he spent 21 days in the hospital with a collapsed lung, so it wasn't like a dramatic holding Douglas's hand while he left. He was still working on that case where the guy shot him in the hospital bed, as advised against, obviously. Judd was able to track the killer via, like, phone book records, and he gained the department's trust, laying on his fucking deathbed with a collapsed lung still catching killers. Judd there earned a favor for his heroism. He got a couple of his cousin's jobs in the Bureau. One, which turned out to be a serial killer. Okay? This is the nepotism of the 1900s. Even if your cousin is a serial killer, you can get him a job in the 1900s. Point being there, this guy, Judd, he's got some skeletons in his closet and he didn't even know it. His friggin' own cousin was a serial killer. The people that he worked with, the people that literally he spends 40 hours a week with, of course they knew more about him and knew that he was okay. And then said, hey, we don't really trust your cousin. That's why Douglas admitted. He was like, we didn't really trust you, man. I don't think the Bureau's gonna like your cousins. The Bureau's intuition was right. And so Judd gets demoted for his cousin's actions. They move him to some, like, foreign counter intel program in New York City. That's how law enforcement works. You don't fire the bad apples, you just move them around. But that's what happens in the criminal justice system. Point of that chapter, one of our own. Even though Judd friggin' caught some lead in a firefight and still found the killer, even if they are one of your own, the closest assets to them could be a betrayal. Basically, always have your guard up, Douglas is trying to say. Chapter 11, you could tell... This one was like Douglas's favorite kill, the way he talked about it. He named this chapter the most dangerous game in reference to that 1924 Connell short story where it's about a guy who brings people to his private island to hunt them. You know, the most dangerous game, what you hunt, the most dangerous game, humans. And it ties in perfectly with the book Mindhunter. This is what killers and Douglas do in real life. So you could tell that it was like meta. It was perfect for him. (laughs) It was 1983. There were some underage prostitutes being arrested and telling stories of how their friends are being flown out to Anchorage, Alaska to some cabin in the woods and being hunted for sport. I need to start hanging out with more prostitutes. They probably have all these good ho stories about, you hear about Jenny Cornerblock? Apparently a man flies her out and tries to skin her every weekend. If I was a detective, you probably would say, What are you saying, crackhead? Get out of my office. Douglas dug into this one. He went out to Alaska. He starts going around to the surrounding towns of Anchorage, Alaska, and they were finding bodies under paved roads and out in remote creeks. So this guy's been doing it for a while. These bodies are paved over, literally. One of the things is, though, they were never able to find a bullet hole in the person's clothing that they were buried in. So are you doing a little detective work here? The most dangerous killer would make these women get naked in the wilderness before running out. It's a true hunt. They don't have any shoes or anything. They're a real animal out there running for their life. This is a very creative killer. There were bullet holes in the body though. Of course, how else is he gonna kill them from afar? In all these missing girls cases, it was a high-powered, easily identifiable rifle. So he was a humane hunter. (laughs) He was putting them out of their misery quick. But this guy, (laughs) they know when they go to do their interviews for potential suspects, this guy is going to have massive dead animals that it took some big-ass slugs to take down in his house. Douglas throws up a prediction because they have a good amount of information now. He goes... This killer is going to be ex-army. He's going to be a saver. So he's going to have like tokens from all of the kills in the house. Also, the gun is going to be in a crawl space. It's not going to be in plain view. So he's thinking it's going to be a smart ex-army guy who's all about the hunt and he likes to keep something from the hunt. (laughs) And they're going to need a warrant for this one then. You're not going to be able to catch this killer out in the open you need to find the house of the killer for this specific case what are the odds you're going to be out on the exact night when he's doing his couple time a year hunts the river sting was much easier they literally just had to camp out one river to catch this killer (laughs) that killer wishes there were multiple rivers in this city to dump more bodies switch it up a little bit this is an impossible stakeout you got to get creative on john's side to catch this guy 
and they narrow it down to all the ex-army men in Anchorage and get the interns to start punching numbers, and they find this guy, Hanson, go into his beautiful, massive cabin, found expensive-ass jewelry that they think might have been stolen, so smart guy, criminals are often involved in many lanes of crime. But most importantly, on one of the desks, they didn't find the gun. The gun was in a crawl space like he thought. The smoking gun, <laughs> bad pun timing, was an aviation map on this guy's desk with like 50 X's all over Anchorage, Alaska. He would fly his plane out to random parts in Anchorage, let the girl out, hunt her naked, and then put the body in a ravine or under a road or something. And he put an X where he killed them. He, this was on his desk. He loved to look at it. Like, he was a saver. He was one of those types of killers who really loved what he did. That was his craft. Hansen pled guilty, this sicko, and was sentenced to 499 years in prison. I hope he stays alive that long. <laughs> And so that was really the most dangerous game, but he kept talking about more killers throughout the chapter. I'll make it quick. He talked about a Delaware killer who changed his MO from home invasion break-ins to van capture rape beatings <laughs> along I-40 and 13. Keep your eyes out there, blue hens. <laughs> John Douglas. He caught this killer in Newcastle, Delaware. This is where I received my higher education. When I was there, I heard some creepy stories about, like, there's parts upstate in the woods where you'd hear of meetings of, like, kid touchers and Joe Biden's living up there. So maybe it is just his crew hanging out in the woods. <laughs> Newcastle County, Delaware, the cancer capital of the world. Has the country's biggest tax haven, a.k.a. murder town, the highest murder rate per capita, Wilmington. It's a very special little place they got going over there. John Douglas is hunting killers. <laughs> Staying ahead of the curve. And it's the later 80s now. And the problem that he's starting to deal with towards the latter half of the book is that these people he's putting away, they get a fair trial in America. As a defendant... They are saying that their psychological motives were unclear. The insanity plea is really gaining traction at this time. And so he knows there can't be any friggin' air holes in his game. It's got to be airtight to catch these criminals. Otherwise, they could just say they were crazy. He has to show exactly how this person was going about their killings. Chapter 12, Hurting the Ones We Love. And who hurts the ones we love? Mothers. They don't do anything loving or nurturing. Moms, they lock their kids in cars when they go grocery shopping. And that is where our first kill takes place. <laughs> there was this very particular case. And remember, John has to be very particular with his details when putting a case together. There was like a mitten left on the ground. And the mom left it exactly there for a few days while several detective teams came and saw. And she said it was a capturing and the mitten was the fucking smoking gun in this one. It looks like a plant, mom. A killer isn't gonna... Like, someone who's a 140 IQ killer abducting kids isn't gonna leave a fucking mitten on the side of the road. That's something a mom would do who's trying to frame a killer when she just didn't want to deal with a toddler anymore. John discovered there are three reasons that people take kids. For profit... You're hearing this with Epstein, there's a global trade for it. So if you want to start selling some kids, hey, maybe I do want to have kids. Molestation. Why else would you want to take a kid? Or some people can't have one of their own, but those are the super far between cases where like psychos will actually go and steal someone else's kid to have. Very uncommon. And this is below Douglas's pay grade here. The fucking mitten on the ground. The key to a murder, go watch CSI. Go watch any low-level show. The key to a murder by a loved one is the staging. They always make sure it looks like someone else did it. That's why Douglas was like, okay, ma'am, your kid's mitten is still on the ground there. You didn't r sprint to your car and pick up the mitten thinking, hold up, why is my kid's mitten outside the vehicle? No, she got inside the car and left it there. You know, it doesn't add up. It was in, like, Wilkes Bar, PA. Just some mom who fucking yeeted her kid off a cliff. I think she, like, killed and then dissolved the body. And then she drove to a grocery store, threw the kid's mitten on the ground, and was like, Police, come here! A psycho man took my kid! No, bitch. You're trying to frame us with mittens. <laughs> 
So John learned people will hurt the ones that we love and they'll try to frame it as a serial killer. She was literally wasting Douglas's time. He could have been catching such bigger people interviewing such more elaborate minds than this stupid bitch who thought she wasn't going to get caught. A cool part Douglas ended the chapter with was he said that he can't empathize with his work. <laughs> like me right now, I am fucking glorizing the killer's works for comedic purposes. If he started to fanboy over a killer's work or feel bad, it would definitely get in the way of his pursuit. Or even if he like started to feel bad for the missing kid and be like, oh my god, this mom is in such pain. Oh my god, this kid never got to grow up and suffer life. If he starts doing those thoughts on the job, it's going to get in the way of efficient police work. And so he learns not to let his emotions get in the way of the work, which ties to the name of the chapter, Hurting the Ones We Love. Chapter 13, God Wants You to Join Shari Fay. The chapter was really just like a compilation of victims' last words when the killer lets them have last words. And that's like another killer's fetish. One of these things. Oh, man. What if you had the power knowing you were giving someone their last words? In these interviews, Douglas was saying, these killers, by doing this, are trying to figure out their victim's final thoughts. So you could take someone's life. You can never know what they're thinking, though. When you're going, any last words? <laughs> you're just trying to read someone's mind at that point. If you're a man, you'll go out with no words. You'll take your secrets to the grave. If you're a bitch, then you'll start to squeal. <laughs> And so it really is a power play from the killers there to find out, yeah, who's a bitch, who's gonna fucking be a man while looking down the barrel of a loaded gun. So this little girl, Shari, is missing, and her family gets a ransom note. <laughs> Creepy case, the killer is in contact with the family. That's a nightmare. So the feds are in the town. That's terror, because now every other family is going, oh my god, that's gonna be our family next. It's not. But you have to then put the pros that the, oh, the FBI is here, so we're so much more safe. No, this killer is still on the loose. But John was able to not be undercover on this one. And so the FBI stakes out there for weeks to make everybody feel safe. You know, a little girl missing for weeks is not a good look. <laughs> weeks later, they find the body, Shari's body, in a missing outfit. It hadn't been worn for, like, months at a time, so they knew she was being kept alive naked somewhere, and then the clothes were put back on before the killer released her body. And after the killer released the body, the family got a second ransom note. And this one was saying, the title of the chapter, God wants you to join Shari Faye. This is fucking the night before Halloween, man. He's saying, in cutout magazine letters... I am about to kill your second daughter and keep her alive in my dungeon for weeks. And the FBI is there, and they're still getting torturous threats. And women say men don't have emotion. If desire is considered an emotion, then these killers are the most men have to offer for you women. You want a passionate marriage? One of these killers are the men for you. This is not a good look for the FBI now. The girl was missing. Now there's ransom notes while the FBI is there. It's not just the local precinct that looks like a bunch of Mahoney's. So John pulls out the oldest trick in a book. He puts the little girl Shari Faye's favorite koala bear on the top of her grave in hopes that, you know, the killer will go there and take the koala bear as a trophy. But the killer saw the bait and then threatened the family on a three-way call. The night after, he was like, Boy, I saw you put a motherfucking stuffed animal on my dead girl's grave, referring to her as, like, his own, a real fucking sicko, man. And he's just playing with the detective now, and he goes, yeah, I saw that little stupid koala bear. Do you guys know about a uh, little 10-year-old Leo Hemlock up in uh, Richland County? Yeah, he's been dead for a week. If you guys want to go up there, you'll probably find his body. This guy was a evil genius, man. He was toying with the detectives. He had him straight up whipped. So <laughs> Douglas got like super embarrassed on this one. He, he had to <laughs> stole the family's little girl's koala bear and then found out another kid was dead a county over from the serial killer. Finally, 
they make an arrest on this guy larry jean bell who was living in his parents house with lists all over the walls and shit as i look around my room and just wonder when is the first kill gonna happen <laughs> but i mean this guy should have been caught I'm fine. <laughs> this guy at the age of 19 and then again at 25, he got arrested for forcing girls into his car with knives and guns. Way to keep your eye on this guy, FBI. Who do you think's going to do the mass shootings? Probably the guy forcing girls into his car with knives. What the heck did you think was going to happen? <laughs> you know what they say, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, serial killer on the loose. <laughs> And to chapter 13, to catch this Larry Jean Bell guy, he was too smart. He was sending the ransom notes. He was way too high level. A bunch of countries had to cooperate with, like, living records to put him away because he wouldn't talk. But, you know, it showed how all the law enforcement agencies can come together when something this gruesome is on the loose and it's not just fighting for funding. They caught this killer before he was able to get Shari's sister, Dawn. She became a gospel singer. Isn't that cute? She went on to go spread the Lord's word, spread some love around. Fuck yeah. Chapter 14, anyone can be a victim. A liberal's favorite chapter. <laughs> we are in the falling action of the book. You could tell by now. We learned about his favorite kill up in the woods, the most dangerous game. He's learned most of what he could through his career. He thinks he's a badass. I consider him a badass. He's thinking like a killer, personalizing his work. Anyone can be a victim. Yo, that class where that teacher made me <laughs> made me watch a gay porn about a guy sucking dick. Anyone can be a victim. We spent two weeks in that class on intersectionalities. I don't want to have to fucking waste airtime on my created show to talk about bullshit. But it's like a social justice concept where things happen in your life which earn you victimhood points. It's like I'm black and gay so I get more credits. No! Fucking work harder than me, bitch. <laughs> Anyway, this woman's study class, she's wasted two weeks, so $600 then worth of tuition to be talked down to about how people have hard lives. Yeah, everybody's got it hard. It's the work that separates people. John found this out. That's why he's saying anybody could be a victim. You can be a victim if you want to be a victim. I don't care. Some people will give you the fucking sympathy you're looking for. And so John's at that top level. He knows anybody could be a victim, and he's taken on, like, those hardest cases. There was what was called the Advil Killer in Chicago. This guy would just pose as a drug dealer and put cyanide in Tylenol pills. This is the old story of how your mom would tell you to be afraid of razor blade and candy. Happy Halloween. <laughs> This is such a low, catchable killer. People who watch the news are never going to believe this chapter. Like, wait, detectives don't always catch the killer. Yes, we literally live amongst psychopaths. It's the best people who are out there. It's the dumbasses who get caught. <laughs> this Chicago Advil killer is probably still slinging. People like that, he didn't have a systematic kill list. He didn't have a fetish. He's a fucking agent of chaos. He's literally just killing randos that come up. So this is like the most depressing killer, man, because there's no story to it. So it's just like depression. It's just a streamline. He's the most depressing killer ever. Oh. I did some agent of chaos shit too, though. But, you know, it was probably in some time when me and my friends had nothing going on. A little period of depression. We would hit rocks over the overpass with tennis rackets and shit you don't know who the victim is gonna be it's a non-intimate kill well, i would never do this again it's dick it's like i wouldn't ding dong ditch anymore it's not that funny if you're not hiding and watching the person there's nothing to the prank and like <laughs> so maybe the advil chicago killer you could call him the worst prankster ever there was no punchline he's like did you guys get the joke yet it was cyanide <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Douglas threw a Hail Mary again. He suggested staking out the graves. And this time, though, I'm not just bringing it up for no reason. They jumped out on someone mourning the grave next to the victim. So they were like, FBI, put your hands up! And this guy was like, what are you talking about? I'm mourning my recently killed daughter. 
they fucking ruined this guy's morn because John Douglas's dumb trick was thinking they would be able to catch the Advil killer. The Advil killer wants chaos. You know, he doesn't want one of these intimate gravesite visits. Eventually, he would have never been caught. Bob Sigowski was the guy's name. He confessed. So that was a cool part for John to admit, even though he is kind of a master at his craft. It's a flaw, not that it's a flawed system, it's a fair game. You're not going to be able to catch everybody, even if you are the best. And then things were getting worse toward the late 80s, like, people learned, like I said, it's a fair game on both sides. Other criminals learned from the Advil killer that you can use this type of blackmail, just like the anthrax mailer, the guy who sent senators anthrax in the mail. In the book, he was saying people like freaking abducted him from his house in New Jersey to be ransomed. It's getting even dirtier towards the later half of his career. So he came in 70s when like serial killers started to be a thing. But now there are like um, pirates, man. They're like extortionists using leverage to barter for things. Now it wasn't even written in the book, but there's about to be some books written about like black hat hackers and shit. It's the new serial killer crime wave that's gonna happen and especially in that cyber sense anybody could be a victim all you have to do is have a credit card to be a victim there chapter 15 here battle of the shrinks he's trying to prove are they crazy or did they snap and like we saw in the hostage situations because hostage is like a one-time go you are not anonymous you you have one shot at it and then you are put on a watch list you get your money you could take your money and run but for the killers are they crazy or did they snap it's probably they snapped and then they're crazy was the point of the chapter so he's working with another guy to do the battle of the shrinks this is when insanity pleas are really starting to ramp up the defendant in question here was Thomas Vanda. He was known for stabbing someone, but Douglas said that he was smart enough to do a lot more than just stab someone. And so he was said to be responding well to the medication they were giving him and therapy, and he had a potential early release. But Douglas thought this guy Vanda was playing the local law enforcement. He thought this guy did a serial stabbing of multiple people and then just got bopped on one hit with mental disability or whatever they call it and now he's being released again and douglas is out there in quantico and he's like i'm keeping my eye on this motherfucker this guy's about to start killing people again i know it him and the local shrink then agreed that none of the serial killers that they came across had been insane but they were normal their disorder was killing they needed to do that and so this guy never re-offended, but it's good to have people like John Douglas with a hunch watching over this psychopath. He got off in initially by what was called complex partial seizure state. So he was going, yeah, I was just in a seizure when I was stabbing those people. Multiple times, dude. There's a name for every disease now. People are literally diagnosing their fucking intersectionalities. <laughs> Some term that my professor made up four years ago. People are now taking pharmaceuticals for their own personal intersectionality diagnosis it's a slippery ass slope battle of the shrinks these sexual killers like thomas vanda are more likely to repeat their crimes one of the conclusions that the battle of the shrinks brought us was that there's a fine line between a psychopath and someone who is psychotic like a psychopath is someone who isn't crazy but they break rules and then someone who is psychotic is someone who doesn't even follow their own rules. That's a better way to put it. Like, someone who's a psychopath follows their own rules. And then someone who's psychotic has no rules. <laughs> so it's hard to get an insanity plea if you're a psychopath. You gotta try to be in the courtroom going... <laughs> and be fucking psychotic while you're on the defendant stand to try to get off. And what Douglas is out there is going... I'm a really good detective and it took me months to track down this asshole over here. He is a psychopath. He is not psychotic. <laughs> and that's like him, Douglas, versus the other shrink who is the defendant trying to prove the insanity plea. And so it's always a battle of the shrinks for him. And I'll take us to chapter 16. This one is our final choipter. Sometimes the dragon wins. 
It's late, late, late in Douglas's career, and he tracks people on watch lists who are fucking likely to buy Barbie dolls or adult males buying dresses. I mean, now that's not a thing, but back then, it's in the book, man. I'm not doing hate speech. This was a tell for people who have gender dysphoria. And so John's going now, like, he, he was a beat cop. He knows you can do us versus them as much as possible, but you got to try to get your watch lists going. Find the patterns. That's all, like, crime is. That's all society is, but that's all crime is, you learn in criminal justice. That's all anything is. That's what education is. You're just learning the patterns of things. But you can really break down the crime one. It's not just bad people, man. It's people who are bought up in this classic tale of shit <laughs> that gets told over and over and over and over and over and over and never listened to. And Douglas knows partially why he wrote this book. Most psychiatrists, healthcare professionals, and cops don't have this background. He's trying to say he won the Battle of the Shrinks here, basically. That I can win in a courtroom, so I can win by writing a book. No. <laughs> in a courtroom, there's a winner and a loser. When you're putting your voice out there on the internet or publishing a book, there's no defined winner or loser. You're always going to have an op-ed. And he takes us on a little victory tour. Some of his favorite places in his career. Over in Mount Rainier, by the Green River. Um, <laughs> he was like his favorite body dump site wasn't revising this last part of his chapter there were a lot of like 16 year old bodies being found there and it was in the 1975 area <laughs> i don't know he just was like was saying that was like a fucking cool interesting creepy place so think about like haunted houses these are the real haunted houses that scare that you get when you go into a haunted house he gets that for real walking into a room where it's not peeled grapes and spaghetti pretending to be intestines on the ground he gets the real shock of a mutilated corpse on the ground no jump scares but it's equally as unnerving that'll make your stomach be doing flips like it's at the x games man <laughs> he wanted to mention how there was a killer he caught by pseudonym so like the killer sent the detective a message which then john got to read it was a tip from thomas gillian and carlton smith saying it will be a taxi driver and that message was a pseudonym it was the killer's name all jumbled up i don't like is this guy writing soliloquies like shakespeare on accident like is that his writing style is he that much of a genius killer or was he trying to get caught because that's retarded if you're a killer not trying to get caught why would you put your name in your message why are you even talking to the detective so it goes back to that thing maybe they do subconsciously want to get caught towards the end hold some weight as we get to the end of the book like chapter two my mother's name was holmes he's solving pseudonyms catching dudes that are on barbie doll watch lists he's undeniable man he's reached the top of his craft he has the most elite unit under his control and he was able to interview someone who he really wanted to he was always obsessed with the manson family murders throughout his career so the fbi let him talk to lynn Fromm, who was one of the head assassins from the Manson family. If you saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that movie was a banger! <laughs> All about the Manson family murders. Law enforcement didn't let anybody talk to this lady. They wanted her to have a bad life because she did a lot of killings for Charlie Manson when they were trying to catch the guy. And they weren't lust kills again. These were kills told to her what to do by Charlie Manson. So he got like secondhand Manson knowledge, which was pretty friggin' cool a real perk to making it to the top of your career <laughs> john douglas if only back in the day he had if podcasts were a thing back then he would have the killer cast and then he made it to the top of the fbi he got to talk to the best and most notorious killers final points he was going always stay a step ahead future detectives and he's saying moving forward throughout the decades in his career alone and he think will only increase is extreme virtue signaling from one side or another is a good sign of a serial killer so if you got 
Nick Cruz uh, wearing around the MAGA hat and talking about ethnic cleansing and shit. That's like extreme alt right. Yeah, you probably got a mass murderer. Or if you got, like John Douglas is saying, these men who are fucking buying little girls clothing and shit. Oh, that's progressive. He identifies as a little girl. He, you're going to find a little girl in this creep ass's basement. Educate and stay a step ahead. That's really what we learned from John Douglas. He was in the most bullheaded career, the Blue Brotherhood, the cops, and he said, get out of my face. I would much rather read a book than talk to your dumbass. And that's what he did. And he was able to then talk to the coolest people, motherfucking serial killers. <laughs> There's something really cool about it. <laughs> Happy October. I am for sure on a watch list. <laughs> and so Douglas is finally promoted to the chief of the behavioral science unit, which he finally gets changed to the investigative support unit because he didn't want to be literally called the BS unit. That's what they were called. He changed it to the ISU. That sounds badass. It makes a lot less sense compared to what they do. Investigative support. That's what the NSA is doing now. You were doing behavioral science. It should still be called that. And it's early 90s, John Douglas starts doing international work. He can solve 150 cases a year. He knows that's his stride, but he's solving like 50 a year and traveling the world now. His, the FBI is like, you earned the fuck out of that, man. Go ahead, do whatever. While he's away traveling the world, the administrative fell a little bit loose. But then when he came back, he's like, good, keep it this way. It was way too uptight the entire time. And while he's away... It's mid-90s, I think it was 95, The Silence of the Lambs came out. So late 90s, 96 it was, he came back and was like, everybody in the investigative support unit recognized him. He's a fucking legend. They all read the stories coming up through the FBI Academy. They've heard of John Douglas, and now they got to see a movie about this guy. You literally can't work alongside someone like that anymore. He's legend status. It's more helpful to have him outside of the bureau as a figurehead than to be working with him anymore. So he earned his retirement. And John ends it with a wholesome point. None of these killers came from a functional family support unit. So you need a supportive mom and a dad, bruh. And then you won't be a serial killer. We need to thank John Douglas for making law enforcement just that much less bullheaded and a little more woke or whatever you want to say to the psychology behind criminality and giving me something interesting for the show <laughs> that'll do us everybody john douglas's mind hunter one more thank you to john douglas for cleaning up the streets they'd really be running red with blood if it weren't for him but let them run red for Halloween. I hope you all have a very special and fun month of October. I hope you college people, college Halloween is God tier level holiday. Do not let that one slip through your hands. Have your threesomes, get alcohol poisoning, do what you gotta to have a good time. And that'll bring us to next month's book, November. Get ready for a good time, everybody. I know you will still be hungover from Halloween when I'm ready to release this episode. <laughs> I will keep the party going for you with Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. November, biggest road trip month in America, biggest traveling month. You are about to take a convertible ride with me and Hunter S. Thompson to Las Vegas. It is going to be easily one of our most fun episodes. This book is a cult classic blockbuster movie with Johnny Depp. And if you know a thing or two, Hunter S. Thompson is one of America's most cherished creative writers. I won't waste your time. You know a thing or two about him. You know he is heavily involved in the drug culture, and that is what this book is about. I cannot wait to be sharing stories, talking trips, partying, going red line with you all for November and our 11th episode. Hunter's going to have his suitcase full of drugs for us. I'm bringing my typewriter for the writing tips, and you listeners are just going to need your ears as well to have a good time next month. Keep on keeping on over at Harry Shit. Over 12,000 followers there, building a brand, putting out stories, being controversial, pushing Instagram's limits. 
it's something to be a part of and the youtube page is growing the show gets better so thank you guys keep on subscribing move that mouse over that big juicy red button click away throw a mouse at your monitor if you need to thank you guys very much <laughs> and i'll see y'all next month get ready for a high frequency november Peace.